Sling and Things. Sup again, and welcome to Sling and Things. Today I'm reviewing a neat documentary that I watched a lot when I was growing up called The Atomic Cafe. The reason I watched it at all, I'm going to be very transparent here, is because it was hosted for free on a website, and when I was a kid, because I'm old, YouTube didn't exist, torrents barely existed, and the internet was really slow, people were still using modems, and so it used to be extremely challenging to see a movie on your computer. Those were dark days. And anyway, the Atomic Cafe was hosted on a public domain site, because most of this film is just archival footage that's been repackaged, and because it was easily available to me, I wound up watching it over and over and over again. And as a result, it became very formative to me. It very much shaped the way that I look at things. And so, I figured I would talk about this movie. And because it mostly consists of old footage and newsreels, I actually feel okay showing some clips of it, which I will do once I formally introduce... 1982's The Atomic Cafe, which was directed by three people, Kevin Raftery, Pierce Raftery, and Jane Loader. It is an hour and a half long, and it is about the atomic age in America. It covers the beginning of the Cold War and how the United States reacted to knowing that weapons now existed that had the potential to wipe out entire cities in the blink of an eye. The Atomic Cafe is one of the most impressive documentaries I've ever seen in part because it doesn't utilize a narrator, or lots of text, or a single sit-down interview. It tells its narrative completely through newsreels and commercials and propaganda films from the 1940s and 50s. And that alone is quite the accomplishment. Telling a coherent story entirely through highlights is not easy. There is a reason you don't see a lot of documentaries made this way. But to truly appreciate what an undertaking this was, consider that the three directors made this film in 1982, when there was no internet. Back then, it took an enormous amount of legwork to physically gather footage like this. These days, compiling this research wouldn't be that hard because of how available everything is, but back then, it was so difficult to assemble this material that it took them five years to make this movie. These directors dedicated a big part of their lives so that people in the early 1980s could see this. It was an incredible undertaking, and it's a prime example of why it's good to give some leeway when we're assessing older pieces of entertainment like this, when it was harder to make stuff. The Atomic Cafe might not look as crisp as a modern documentary, but it took every bit as much effort to make it, and then some. The benefit of making the film the way it is is that it comes off as extremely objective, The Atomic Cafe deals with the aftermath of World War II, and the way that the American public received the threat of possible nuclear annihilation. And the thing with making movies about war and doomsday devices is that it's such a heavy topic that it can be hard to make a movie about it without it coming off as preachy. With this movie, though, all you're doing is watching footage about the early years of the Cold War that is spliced together with music from that time period. There are no opinions or arguments verbally stated within this documentary. It leaves its message entirely up to you, the viewer. And as a kid, I found that really effective because it came off to me as an authentic glimpse into how America behaved during the Cold War. Whereas if it was chock full of interviews or something, I might not have perceived it that way. And as a young American myself, I found what I was seeing in this film rather enlightening. So, one of the earliest segments in this film is on the Bikini Atoll bomb testings. In the mid-1940s, America was searching for a place to test the atom bomb, a place that wasn't all that populated. So what they did is, they went to this tiny little island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean called Bikini, where all these native people had been living in peace, and the U.S. government basically evicted them from their homeland, so that they could conduct bomb tests on their island. Behold a very uncomfortable pair of clips from the Atomic Cafe. And thus the natives expressed to the people of the United States their welcome. 
despite the fact that the atoll of Bikini may be utterly destroyed come July the 1st. But to the natives, in their simplicity and their pleasantness and their courtesy, they're more than willing to cooperate. Although they don't understand the world of nuclear energy any more than we do. And though they have no way of understanding what the test is all about. American officials discussed plans with the Bikini natives for the evacuation of the atoll. The islanders are a nomadic group and are well pleased that the Yanks are going to add a little variety to their lives. We then watch as the Bikinians are all put onto boats and they're all happy and smiling and singing. And then you watch as the United States Army drops a massive atom bomb on what was now their test site. And as a kid, this horrified me. It was stunning to learn that my country had done this to someone and that I had never heard about it either. And the truth is, yeah, the United States turned the indigenous people of Bikini into vagabonds. They conducted so many bomb tests on the island that they rendered it unlivable. And learning that was heartbreaking. It was like the first time it ever occurred to me, wow, my country isn't as great as I thought it was. My country has done some terrible things to people. And then, of course, once you know that, you get on the rabbit hole of, what else has my country done that's not that great? And the answer is, a lot. And you see that in the film. You see the way that Americans turned on one another during the Red Scare. And it's pretty shameful. Another thing that was revelatory to me in watching the Atomic Cafe was seeing how the government tried to educate people about the atom bomb and what the American public should do if Russia ever launched one. And what's amazing is the U.S. government decided that the best way to warn its citizens about the bomb was to essentially tell them that they had nothing to worry about. Nothing so long as they behaved in an orderly fashion as depicted in this famous civil defense film. shells to crawl into like Bert the Turtle, so we have to cover up in our own way. Paul and Patty know this. No matter where they go or what they do, they always try to remember what to do if the atom bomb explodes right then. It's a bomb. Duck and cover. Here's Tony going to his Cub Scout meeting. Tony knows the bomb can explode any time of the year, day or night. Duck and cover. a boy, Tony. That flash means act fast. So, there's a lot to unpack there, right? The government was telling children, okay, at any given moment, no matter where you are, no matter what time of day it is, there is a chance that our enemies are going to fire a weapon at us that could kill everyone. But don't worry, if this happens, and it could happen, all you need to do is duck and cover, and you'll be fine. All you need to do is hide under your desk, hide against the wall, and you'll be fine. Now, what was really surprising was discovering in my additional research to this that there actually was a scientific basis for ducking and covering. If you were far enough away from the blast zone, ducking and covering really could prevent you from suffering some serious injuries in an atom bomb explosion, believe it or not. What the duck and cover cartoon doesn't say, though, critically, is that if you weren't far away from the blast zone, ducking and covering was pretty damn useless, and you wouldn't be saved from total destruction just by crouching into a ball. And the inherent absurdity of footage like that is what the Atomic Cafe revels in. What happened in the 1940s and 50s is that Americans adapted to the possibility of getting hit with a bomb by just incorporating it into their everyday lives. Houses were built with fallout shelters. Bomb drills were conducted regularly in schools. Children were brought up learning what to do if they had to survive in an irradiated wasteland. There's a detached complacency to all of these clips in the documentary. And it's hard to watch them all without seeing parallels to the way that America has historically dealt with 
other major issues, which has been to more or less tolerate them and let them fester for the sake of not inconveniencing other people. The most ridiculous thing about that duck and cover cartoon isn't what it was proposing kids should do. It's that it existed in the first place. It's that humanity was teetering on a confrontation so dangerous and so potentially catastrophic that the U.S. government felt that the only way the public could cope with it is if they were more or less lied to, is if they were told that all of this, everything that was happening in relation to the Cold War, was necessary and fine. It's why the Atomic Cafe winds up being an anti-war movie without it explicitly saying it's an anti-war movie. It's an anti-war movie because when you see the lengths that people went to in order to delude themselves that this was all okay and that this type of weapon was worth having around, I think regardless of your politics, you'll come away thinking that maybe we'd be better off if nuclear warheads weren't a thing. Just maybe. As much as I like the Atomic Cafe, it is worth conceding that it's not as comprehensive as it might have been if it wasn't made in this style. Because it's almost exclusively showing you the headlines from that time period, what you're not getting from this movie is a lot of context, and a lot of this material is interesting enough that I wouldn't have minded if the documentary had gone a little deeper on some of this. For instance, it would have been nice to know more about what happened to the Bikinians, or more about who Ethel and Julius Rosenberg were. Also, in order to watch this, you have to be okay with a lot of this footage being super grainy. I saw the remastered version of the Atomic Cafe for this review, and it does look better, but there's only so much you can do when you're working with incredibly old footage. So, if the highlights I showed you earlier weren't compelling to you, then maybe this documentary isn't for you. For me, however, I was still into this. I have always had a morbid fascination in the existence of mushroom clouds, and the fact that we're capable of generating explosions like this that are the size of skyscrapers. It's horrible, but it's also hard to turn away from, and even after all these years, I still think there's value in seeing how the atom bomb was initially sold to people, and how it changed the American culture. And to be really specific, if you've ever played one of those Fallout video games, and if you've ever wondered where its saccharine corporate aesthetic comes from, like if it was based on anything real, you might be interested in the Atomic Cafe. And if you are, it's not that hard to find. <laughs>